cannot judge, like Celia's describing there, cannot judge our clinical expertise. They don't know how to decide whether they're a good clinician or not. But like Celia's just described, they know whether we answer the phone right or not. It might well be the physio had 10 more letters after their name, but their receptionist didn't answer the phone right, so they didn't get Celia's business. And Celia would know perfectly well whether the skirting boards were clean or whether the towels were clean. The worst conversation, the worst clinical stuff. The, the worst conversation I ever had, we were sitting in a chiropractic clinic, we will remain nameless, at south of Dublin that we used to have a practice in. Uh, the phone call went, uh, hello, yes, I think I've said this before, uh, no, no, no physio here, no, okay, thanks, bye-bye. Mm. Phone call. Now, that's the that's a chiropractor who hadn't trained that lady because the person phoned up and asked for physio. We talked about this before. And she just said, why, the five words, why, what have you done? It's a whole different conversation. I would have been, she would have told her right about her back problem mm. and the thing, that's the other. And great, we've got the old chiropractor here. We can book you in. That was a thousand, two thousand, three thousand <clears throat> euro phone call that just went no, no, no physiotherapy here. Goodbye. This is the Justin Blake podcast experience for health professionals that mean business. So wherever you are in the world, listen as we discuss everything you need for you and your health business to survive and thrive. Thanks for listening. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi, everybody. We're again here Wednesday morning. It comes around so quickly. It does. That I bought in the shop, Celia. And uh, yeah, it was fantastic. And I got to stay out of the antique shop. They'll What's never get yeah. Pardon? It's a compass. A compass. Yeah, it's beautiful. Look. We're not going to get lost this morning. I mean, it's like <laughs> something or other. Anyway, there's an African art that Celia wants to. Uh, so Celia may go. We'll let Dave in, shall we? <coughs> no, Dave is down there. Look, he had some hair, but maybe it's just a shadow. No, no, I have. I've got, I've got a bit of hair at the moment. It's cold on the bike, so I, I can't. <laughs> I've got, to have, I've got to have a bit of hair to make sure that I'm warm. It's important. Of course, I can't play tennis today because I don't know whether you saw. Uh, I'm going for an ultrasound scan. I tore my uh, gastrox on uh, Sunday playing tennis. Shit. You know, I, so, I've, got, yeah. I've got the perfect perfect rehab exercise for you called cool. cycling. <laughs> cycling. Yeah. yeah. It's the only exercise where you can sit down all the time and be quite happy. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. I mean, I can't even walk on it, so I don't know whether it's like... You've done a good job of it, then. You've really done a good job of it. Oh, yeah. It felt like I've been... I mean, I actually, it felt like somebody had hit a ball really hard into the back of my car. I actually turned around and looked to see whether there was somebody there. I mean, thank F it wasn't an Achilles tendon. You know, I was preparing for it because, you know, as clinicians, we know six, eight weeks, you know, muscle t- tendon turnover time. That's the normal time after new activity, you start to get an injury. You're very generous to yourself there. I was thinking, yeah, you hit all the criteria with the sport and the age group. <laughs> yeah. So it was like literally, it was like somebody, it was literally, it was like somebody uh, said, hit a tennis ball really, really hard into my uh, calf. And I was like, who the fuck? I was like, there was nobody there. And it was like, and then I went to take a step and I was like, oh, yeah, and then it was absolute agony for about four or five hours. I mean, really, really, right. first two hours just com- constantly cramping and constantly, uh, yeah. Oh, you've got the best part of a year to get up to 900 miles on here. Pardon me? You've got the best part of a year to get up to 900 miles on your bike. I'm <laughs> saving, I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, so I'm going for an no, ultrasound. I didn't sleep last night. <laughs> ultrasound scan later in Belfast with like took the, the main sports surgery clinic in, in Dublin uh, phoned them yesterday four week wait for an ultrasound wow. scan I was like you're having a laugh you're the main sports injury place in Dublin the sports centre where I got my hip done four weeks it's okay I know one of the ra- consultant radiologists could actually could give him a ring and get myself in pretty quick for four weeks you guys are you, are you for real and she was like yeah I was like, it'll be healed by that stage. What sort of service is that? Anyway, I could get another one in, in Dublin. I think it was tomorrow afternoon or on Friday, Friday or Saturday. But I'm going to go to Belfast and see a colleague. Anyway, that's enough about me and my two, three weeks off tennis. I was due to I was due to compete in a tennis. No, you've, got, you've got another you've got another 27 minutes to talk about your injury. Come on. 
I was going. I was looking through Celia's chapters here and about the painless, the, the painless practice, and about the, the pipeline. And one of the things was about you know turning up and doing talks. Guess what? I never love doing. <laughs> you know, talking at things, talking at events. Yeah, you may find that surprising, but I never did. I did a couple of diabetic <laughs> evenings and different things like that. But yeah, bulletin boards, flowers, great. Me, where is it? Tactic. Anyway, well, we're else. going. So we're going backwards now, Justin. We're on chapter four already. Why are you still on chapter three? We're doing pipelines. It's two weeks of pipelines. No, we're doing patience. <laughs> no, two chapters. Yeah, we did pipeline last week. Two, two, we did two chapters last week. This week because there's two. No. <laughs> all right. No, no, no. Tell us all about the no. patience, Celia. We need to look after the patients now. Do you want to go? Do you want to pause and read the chapter uh, quickly? The <laughs> Run the clinic without the patient. <laughs> we will see. We will be back next week at the same time. Mm. Continue. Well, thank you. Great. A minute ago, just because Celia and I always have to go and sort school runs and get heard everybody out the door at half past seven. Justin very generously offered that we could start at half past six next week. Half past six. The progress of his gastro. We'll be an hour up. I've been up since half three this morning. So you know, could you, a chef friend, <laughs> I'll, around I'll, be, I'll be out. We'll I'll be out on my bike at half six, so okay. you'll... Uh... <laughs> I mean, half an hour is not long enough. And I mean, yeah, I think I said that. That's because you ramble all the time. No, stop. Okay, no, I'll shut up then. <laughs> Let me hear your word. <laughs> okay, so we're doing the patient pillar today. So the patient pillar is all about the patient journey that you provide to your patient um, and recognizing that yes there is definitely a clinical journey and you want to you know get good outcomes for your patient but there's a very big other part of the journey which is a non-clinical journey so it's recognizing all the different steps in the journey and really understanding what kind of journey you want to provide for your patient um, and making sure that you've got processes in place for every single step of the way and that's kind of in a nutshell the patient journey. The patient pillar. And so All right, we all go home now then, can we? Is that it? That's it. Just go and do the exercises, <laughs> wow your patients, and get on with it. Exercise, wow your patients. But this is, this is something. Oh. This is something which, if you look at every other industry, they tend to do this a lot better than healthcare. Because yeah. they they think they think out the box. They think out the box. You, you got, when you think about... Hotel or a Marriott or a, or, a, or a, you know, have you been... Yeah, shit. You want service? Go to the Four Seasons for a day. That's but people that. know what those people know what those people know what those hotels are and what they do. If you look at podiatry, people don't know what podiatry necessarily is or does. Yeah, and that's but, where but, we, but, have, but, we have a problem. It just doesn't provide a room and a bit of board. Uh, four Seasons, yeah, just go along and experience it just once in your life. Say about the so if we if we okay let let's let's put the four seasons out of the way and your and your experience of the four seasons and and probably go to another hotel go and look at go and look at the automobile industry go and look at what happens with when you buy a car and when you service a car they service your car but it's the the other stuff they do around it as well so they will go and take a, a video of the underside of your car and send it to you they will oh, they will contact. Oh, Speaking of Dave, I was thinking of the hot chocolate in the. I was thinking of the hot chocolate in the machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, that as well. That as well. But you, you've got. I care about the hot chocolate. <laughs> behave yourself it's too early for hot chocolate but you you've got you've got all of these things which they do around it and if you look at a lot of other industries they they have these little kind of tweaks which make it a little bit more special and I, i've been chatting to someone this week about this that, that how could you make every touch point that you have with your patients which is non-clinical just be the, the most amazing thing where they would go wow. and tell somebody else about it mm-hmm. and, and you know things like i mean the one I always touch on is nail surgery. You know, imagine that from nail surgery that you've you've got somebody in, you've assessed them for nail surgery. At the end of the assessment, you send them a video saying, this is what we've talked about today. It's been a lot of information here. You can digest this at your leisure. See you next week for your surgery. Then they have the surgery and it's the same kind of thing. We've given you a lot of information. Here's what to expect. And then you automate things. So 10 days after surgery, we know the wound's going to get a bit a bit nasty. This is what to expect. If you worry, give us a call. Six months after they've healed, they get a message saying, hope everything's okay. You know, we saw you six months ago and your toes healed. If there's any problems, let us know. And it's all those little kind of touch points or, hmm. you know, receiving dressings in the post 
if you if you know you're going to send dressings through, we expect that if you've been doing it properly, you're going to run out of dressings at this point. So here are your dressings. So there's all there's all kinds of things you can do with that. And, and I think one's got to recognise that you've got you know you a lot of you know you spend a lot of time and money and effort on your marketing to get new patients through the door, and you can lose that new patient at any given point. I mean, you know, the first obviously the first thing is if they go onto your website and it's rubbish, they're not even going to ring you. If they ring you and the reception team don't handle it efficiently and professionally, you're going to lose them. I mean, I. Uh, you know, you 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 will know that I've been going to a physio lately, but I'd phoned a different um, practitioner before. I'd phoned a different clinic, and the experience was horrendous with a receptionist. Just at that point, I phoned and I wanted an appointment, and they were like, "No, we, we're only doing new patients on this particular day," and that was it. And it wasn't like, you know, can I take your name and details, and if we have a cancellation, I'll ring you, and you know, you know, let me see what I can do for you. There was nothing. The next. Whose ass do I have to kiss here to give you give away my money? Yeah, that type of so, stuff. So and yeah, you know, whereas the next one when I phoned my physio, um, which is a new kind of physio for me now, um, I phoned them. The receptionist answered and she said, "You know, when would you like to get in?" And I said, "Yesterday." And she's like, "Right, let me see what I can do. Let me see what I can, you know, let me help you out here. You're obviously in pain, blah 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 blah." And it was just, it's been an amazing experience. You know, everything about that whole clinic has been. Absolutely amazing, Com- and you know maybe the other really clinic good. would have been the other clinic might have been fantastic once I got in through the door, but I didn't even get that far. No, um, I and I found this chapter in Celia's trainings that I did on this section one of the most impactful and also one of the fastest that you can change the fastest mm. that you can because still the marketing or your purpose is going to take a lot more time and thought this actually once you've got to grips with it you can really start making some very ready changes and your team can be very very um involved and some of the simplest things i remember thinking first of all well i think it was um justin's friend paul right it's about clean to everything being clean do you suddenly recognize that mm-hmm. hotels all these other pieces garages have all given us a standard of service now that we expect and then most of our clients cannot judge like Celia's describing there cannot judge our clinical expertise. They don't know how to decide whether they're a good clinician or not. But like Celia's just described, they know whether we answer the phone right or not. It might well be the physio had 10 more letters after their name, but their receptionist didn't answer the phone right, so they didn't get Celia's business. And Celia would know perfectly well whether the skirting boards were clean or whether the towels were clean. The, the worst conversation I ever had, we were sitting in a chiropractic clinic, we will remain nameless, uh, south of Dublin that we used to have a practice in. Uh, the, the phone call went, uh, hello, yes, I think I've said this before, uh, no, no, no physio here, no, okay, thanks, bye-bye. Mm. Uh, phone call. Now, that's the that's a chiropractor who hadn't trained that lady because the person phoned up and asked for physio. We talked about this before. And she just said, why, the five words, why, what have you done? It's a whole different conversation. I would have been, she would have told her right about her back problem mm-hmm. and the thing, that's the other. And oh, great, we've got the old chiropractor here. We can book it in. That was a thousand, two thousand, three thousand mm-hmm. euro phone call that just went no, no, no physiotherapy here. Goodbye. But maybe, maybe maybe it was a cold caller actually ringing up to sell them advertising to a physio, and maybe she actually saved them a lot of money in the long run. No, this person. Maybe that's, why, maybe that's why they're asking about a physio. Have you got a physio there? I want to. I want to sell you really expensive advertising. Maybe, no, maybe she. Maybe I, she I, dodged I have it. A physio there. I've got a back problem. Do you have a physio there? No, we have yeah. got a chiropractor. See you later. Bye. No five and, words. Bye. What have you done? Write them down. Very simple. Whole other conversation. Red, green, if, green, green brain. This conversation. And if you've done, if you've done, you know, if you've completed chapter one and done your values and, and really understood what is really, really important to you in terms of how you want that patient journey to be, then you'll take those values and apply them. So once you've mapped out your whole journey, you'll say, okay, these are all the steps of my journey. Are we being, I don't know, professional? I mean, that should be a given, but are we being professional in every single step of the way? One of my clients that I did some work with, they wanted to do, come across as knowledgeable and educational. Um, and when we looked at their whole patient journey, the only time that they were really displaying their knowledge and education 
medication was in the treatment room. So we then looked at all the different steps and we said, okay, well, what blogs can you put on your website? What um, information can you put in your waiting room? What information can you send your patients pre their appointment, post their appointment? You know, what information do you give them during their appointment? And, and it just transformed the whole practice and everybody was, you know, behind that educational bit. And sometimes it's the tiniest things. I remember the first time I ordered, I don't think they do it anymore. I remember the first time I ordered something from Wiggle, I got a tiny pack of Haribo in the packaging with whatever I ordered. <laughs> oh my God, I go back to Wiggle every time. Yeah. I can beat I can beat that. I can beat that. I ordered I ordered till rolls. Where's that? I ordered I ordered till rolls from a, a company called Till Roll King, which is the best name ever. And they <laughs> sent me mini dinosaurs. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, Clifton, Clifton Bradley Bradley was on yesterday. He just joined a new gym, and the new gym just sent him a cat with a gym name embroidered on it in the post. So now Clifton's got a new cat. Sorry about that one. Any American visitors? It's it's called Irony. If anybody doesn't know, <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. Somebody sent Clifton a new red cap. Clifton loves red caps. And he is, yeah, brand new red cap with the, with the branding of the gym on it. Who's going to walk around for the next three, four years with the gym on it? So that's what, you know, it's, uh, it's very simple. How much does a cap cost? Four or five quid, stick it in the post. You know, less than a tenner. People remember that. Yeah. I think it, it is. Exercises. Oh, I'm trying to do Instagram at the same time. We used to give people fridge magnets for their exercises, so they stuck them on the fridge, so they have it. Like you have a vet or their dentist and stuff on it. Yeah. We yeah, are, Dave. We're at yeah. one, two, three, five, six, they, six, six, six outlets now. It's still not LinkedIn. Don't know what's happening. They did say it was approved, but. And when you look back. at the when you look at the value of your patient. So if you know, on average, when a patient comes through the door, they will spend X amount, then you can start looking and saying, well, actually, if I spend just this one pound or two pounds per patient, it's, you know, it's a minimal amount if they're spending five, six hundred pounds with us. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, that, and that's as well, Celia, that, I mean, that's a really interesting one, because if you if you also track where your patients come from, so you actually track their route through mm. and you know that a conversation with your receptionist results in patients who spend more money or stay longer versus a conversation with one of your clinicians or vice versa, you know that that's where you're going to focus your attention. You're going to put that mm. person yeah. there having those conversations and being the person who asks why, you know, what's the problem? Because they're going to help to actually convert those to patients who stay longer and who yeah. and who spend more money and get a better outcome. I found it and really actually, helpful. I mean, you're... Go on, yeah. Kate. The, uh, yeah. I found it really helpful because when you're in the clinic, it is what you think about all day, every day, but you forget that for the majority of the population, physiotherapy, osteopathy is not... 50%, 60% of their day, even 40% of their day. It's a tiny bit of their week. Mm. So I found it really interesting to recall a situation where I was buying something and I was completely not really knowing I needed something, but not knowing what I was purchasing and what was it that helped me make my buying decisions. Because that's the situation that most of our clients are in. They know they're in pain. They know they, or they've got to the point they're in pain. They've got to the point they've decided to call you, email you or whatever. Then what is it when you're in that position, when you're buying something you're unfamiliar with, you're buying a, I don't know, whatever gadgets I've had to buy to do this web stuff. I've probably just taken a day to of this and clicked go on Amazon. But, <laughs> but, um, what do you do? What do you look for when you're in those situations? Because they will be very similar to or help you get a better perspective on the position the client's in before they and and actually your your buying behavior was shortcut because dave recommended it so you're going on dave's recommendation and you don't need to go and do any more research if you were going onto amazon and buying it yourself you'd be looking at the reviews you'd be looking at all that kind of thing so that that's really important in the patient journey as well to get those reviews but also to get the feedback from patients about what that journey is like especially those patients that drop out you know Phone them up, yes. And, and I think a lot of practitioners are worried about getting negative feedback and, oh, well, they obviously didn't think it worked or I was rubbish or, you know, they have all this chatter going on in their head. But actually rather find that out, find out what's gone wrong um, in the patient journey so that you can fix it. I totally agree. The most powerful conversations we've had where, where if we'd had a complaint, I'd invite the person for a cup of coffee and really hear them out. And that you yeah. really get some powerful insights. So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Really? Yes. <laughs> and, it's, and, and, you know, it's, it's really interesting because um, I think when you map out the patient journey, a lot of a lot of the time we'll kind of be talking about it and people say, oh, you know, well, what does, you know, what, what does a bricks and mortar really, how does that really impact? How does this silly little, you know, if I put a plant in the corner there, is that really going to make an impact? Is it, is it really going to make an impact if I have the coffee machine or, you know, and it's all these, but it's all those things that add up together. Um, I had a client who had four practices and um, one of the practices was rent a rented room in someone else's practice. And this practitioner that owned the building just was, you know, on her way out to retire wanting to retire she didn't she didn't really care anymore you know she was just like not prepared to um, invest any money in the building and it was just a bit of a rubbish place and when we did the patient journey we went through all the different values that place in particular was just like this does not fit in with your brand at all it just does not fit in and she had tried and tried and tried to get this woman to sort things out and fix the toilet and you know paint the wall and blah blah Blah, blah. Anyway, eventually she decided to close that down and moved her patients from that practice to another practice. And what was interesting was that her patients were very loyal to her, but all of them, like most of them, said to her, oh, my word, this is so much nicer. Um, and actually, you know, whilst I, love you, whilst I love you as an osteopath, I would never, I, w- I wasn't going to refer anyone to you because I was so embarrassed about the actual practice. So, you know, whilst... Yes, she was a clinician and she was getting good results for patients. The environment actually impacted their behavior of not referring others to her. When, when I worked in uh, when I worked in Covent Garden in London uh, for the last two three years before uh, in snow in the snow and rock building on Mercer Street, uh, three or three floors up with a with a glass atrium roof with a gym and a lift in the middle and a whole sort of setup. I mean, patients were fifty percent better as soon as they walked in. I mean, mm. it was absolutely <laughs> stunning, absolutely stunning location. Uh, was that was that just on the days that you weren't working, or was it yeah. all the time? I was all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know, I mean, there's certain colleagues. I mean, there's certain certainly <laughs> the, the lead. <laughs> The leading podiatrist in one of the other podiatry karate associations in Ireland. The first week or two, I, I went down with the guy I was working for to give him a lift to think. This guy was like the president of the whatever it was society. It was up the back steps above a bookies. <laughs> there were so many certificates on the wall. I was like, Jesus, this guy's like robbed somewhere else. He knows nothing but courses. The guy who worked with him used to smoke fags and would just leave the fag butts burning around the place. I mean, the place where I wouldn't put a fucking cat or dog in it. Yet this guy was the president of the Carol Caropody Association. Bloody <laughs> board, brother. You wouldn't put a bloody, it was like a toilet with fag butts and with certificates on the wall. It was a shithole. And people were going there and paying money. And this guy was the leading light in the association. It was bloody atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. <laughs> But, so that, that's know, how that's how not to run a practice. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting. Really, talk, yeah. talk, just sort of just talk about that whole patient journey. I, I I'm going to use a cycling analogy because I can. Um, when the when UK or British cycling decided they wanted to get more medals, I think they had a, a fairly kind of crap time beginning in the 2000s. And then look what they did in 2012. They brought on a guy called Dave, Dave Brailsford, and Dave Brailsford had this this thing called the acquisition of marginal gains. Which yeah, was 100%. looking at every aspect of it and doing one percent. Yeah, the one percent mm-hmm. thing, and it was. So you haven't got to revolutionise anything. It's it's what can you change by one yeah. percent in each of those points, and what can you change by one percent with your your marketing? What can you change by one percent in your coffee machine? There's so many things you can do with it. That and all the stuff taking. You know, I'm a, I'm a big Tour de France fan. Uh, a big shout out to. Uh, what do you call him, yesterday. Uh, Irish guy won the stage. First Irish guy to win the stage of the Tour de France for I can't remember how many years. Sam Bennett. Big shout out to Sam Bennett. Flying the Irish flag in the Tour de France. Winner. The average speed yesterday was nearly 50 kilometers an hour. It was on the flat. It was unbelievable race. Why, why, why uh, so anyway. slow? Oh, shit. Slow? <laughs> I told you before, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law did it, was on the call to Telegraph or somewhere, he'd done it, one of those tap things. And the guy went past him on a unicycle. He said he knew he hadn't done enough bloody <laughs> training when that happened. But anyway, Sam Bennett yesterday <laughs> planned the fight. 
Ireland. Absolutely stunning win. Uh, future Tour de France uh, winner. You know, he's a... Uh, yeah, over, and then the other, I mean, the other part of the other part of the patient journey obviously oh, is the oh, clinical oh, outcomes oh, that you get for your patient, um, and I think it's really, really important to have some kind of system in place to measure that, so that you can start building evidence. And I mean, you know, the, the different professions have different um, different forms of measures. I think you know, physio first have have a really, really um, robust system called Data for Impact, um, where physios can you know gather the evidence, but then benchmark themselves against the rest of the profession. Which um, you know, it's just I think it's really important to be able to gather that evidence and and be able to show that that the treatment that you're offering is evidence based. There's loads of different other systems. I think like chiropractors use Care Response. There's Proms. There's you know there's there's loads of different um, software systems that you can use to measure the outcomes for your patients. And then, and then you've also got the you know practice management uh, software systems where you can start seeing average number of treatments and that kind of thing. So I think having a system in place to measure that is really important. Does everybody not have that already? No, you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. There's they they did a survey I mean, again, I'm a year ironic. or two ago. I'm being ironic you, because like, yeah, mm. some people again like where I used to be who thought busy fool. No money in the bank, working 80, 90 hours a week. Think you're busy. You're not. You know, you're not. You're not ready. Uh, and they're not They're not monitoring. They're not measuring. They're, you know, it's just a constant throughput. And that's it. I mean, you're, you back to pipeline from last week. If you're just attracting loads of new patients but not keeping them. You know, some clinics I know are, 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 would be closed to new patients now because they've got enough. They don't even need, need any more new patients. They've grown enough. They've got their patient base, and they're just you know, they just deal with those patients. They don't take any new patients mm. on. They don't have to. What a brilliant situation to be in. That it is that, that data. That that data is is. I know a system called Clinico uses a a piece of software called Clinic Apps, and that can give mm. you data on, like you say, number of average treatments. Because if somebody comes to you with a heel pain or a, or a calf tear and says, how long is this going to take to heal? You can take that data and you can yeah. say, well, actually, here's our data to show on average it takes six treatments over three months and people get 90% better. And you've got that real data you can put in front of someone and say, well, we, we have the clinical data to show this is our effectiveness. And if you have another practice which says that we can do it in three treatments in, in 10 minutes and you're going to be 100% better, it gives you more kind of choice of, of where to go. But that data is really important. A lot of places don't do it. It's really mm. powerful for managing your team as well. The, the, the first lesson I had in KPIs, key performance indicators, why it was important to start measuring what was going on in my clinic was this number, what was the client visit average? Because the first person I took on, and this is years and years ago, when I saw that their client visit average was two, I was like, right, you're a miracle worker, mm. or you don't care, which is it? And he didn't care, basically. Mm. It was every day. I unfortunately had to let somebody go after uh, three weeks because uh, yeah, their, their patient retention was shit. You know, if I'm going to give you a new patient, I'm going to give somebody else a new patient, and they're seeing them an average of six, eight, ten times, and you're seeing them an average of two. As you say, there's either something wrong, but I just trained you for six weeks about how to do this. So you're obviously not sticking to what we told you to do. So you're done. She got, oh, I think it was the week, the Friday after she started. Like We're 10 not, days. not done. talking about team journey in this, but the point is you'll end up with a, what have, you'll end up with a map, an asset, which is a mapped out client journey, but then you have to have the same for your team and you need to use the same measures and there's cross measures between the two of them because they Everybody are Everybody's totally different from the same like sheet. That. 20, if you're a physio and client, is an average of 20, unless you're working with long term condition management. Again, you can be like, what the hell are you doing? So, you know, yeah. you're, everybody's you're, going to be sticking to the same sheet because uh, people will test you. you know, when they see different clinicians, they ask them the same questions so they get the same answer. You want little mini me's. I want the little mini me's. Talk like me, walk like me. Oh, heaven for this. Gosh. <laughs> so, Kate, it's time for your wrap up. Oh, there yes. we go. The camera's so <laughs> Right, it's time for. Well, and clearly we've all been uh, we've all been let loose this week now we're getting everybody back to school because we're all feeling a bit liberated I think. <laughs> right. 
why are you gastroc? It's time to get on your bike. I think that's the clean lesson from this morning. And you've got about a year to learn to cycle 900 miles and join us all next year when we're doing land and on a goats or something crazy. Um, the patient journey, this is one of the fastest things that you can make a drastic a drastic impact in the performance of your clinic and get your whole team behind implementing and will 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 change um, how you operate. So take a situation where you were a novice and you were purchasing something perhaps you'd never purchased before, maybe a bike, whatever it is, and go through your experience and how you made the decision to feel safe to purchase something that was alien to you. And then with that experience, now look at your clinic client journey, remembering that what you offer is alien to the majority of people and then they're in that same position of vulnerability. Your whole team will be able to get behind it. And if you use seniors flow chart, you can end up with it really beautifully mapped out. And it was one of the most powerful uh, chapters in uh, my experience as a clinic owner and working with Celia. And certainly something that once you have done and completed for your clients, you need to review with your team. Where are you going to get sort of inspiration from? Talk to the VIPs. What do they love? What can they already see? And start there. Yeah. And I mean, there's no point. I was reading something the other day, which is said, good sum up, Kate. I was reading something the other day. People are, again, people are worried about, people are worried about no money. Uh, Charlie, my friend in Australia, is, I think it's just about to drop three and a half grand on a new road bike. Hi, Charlie. Oh, hi, you bag of I'll be your client for life. Right. I'm going to get to the Me too. Take care, guys. <laughs> Right. See you later. Hey, See I mean, you guys. I'm just going to stay on here and just talk. I'm just. Gonna you're going to stay, gonna, stay on. on. I'm. I'm going to go and get the kids ready for school as well. So. Really? I mean, yeah. it's half an hour is low enough. I mean, definitely need to start at half past six. That's just bullshit. Past half. Seven. I, I, I'm. Well, you, you'll get you'll get me live on the bike if you do that. So I'm going to go to the kids. I'll see you later. All right. Then. Okay. Well, cheerio then. I mean, <laughs> bye bye everybody. See you then. Uh, come on then. See ya. I mean, well, that's it. They've all got to get kids to school and do all that sort of stuff. I mean, what's going on? I mean, half an hour is not long enough. But if you think so, let us know. Uh, that's it till next week. I'm going to be on with Sean Savage, my colleague, on uh, on Friday, uh, live, uh, one o'clock Dublin time. I actually going to see Sean Belfast today to have my legs scanned after I tore my uh, gastrox calf muscle uh, playing tennis on uh, on uh, Sunday. What a nightmare. I'm supposed to be in a competition next week and everything. Anyway, that's us. Uh, bye till next time. See you on Friday or next Wednesday. 